Hi everyone, I'm super excited today to be bringing you one of the powerhouses of NCAA Division I Golf. He's a man that's been 16 years at the top. He's won nine NCAA Division I championships. He was the only freshman in 1994 to be on the team, playing with Casey Martin, Noda Big A, and also Tiger Woods. He's a man that has spent hours upon hours with some of the most elite golfers in the world. And he has given me the honor and the privilege of sitting down today and talking about transitioning to college golf and what it takes to be an NCAA Division I golfer. I had the honor of being able to spend many hours at the world-class facility in California and also sitting down with this man in Texas when we went to a college golf camp. He's an absolute champion of a man. Fantastic for him to be able to sit down with us today and help us in New Zealand understand what it takes to be a Division I golfer um, in America. So thanks for joining us today and sit back and relax and welcome on board to our interview, Conrad Ray, the head coach of the Stanford University Division I golf coaching program. I hope you enjoy the interview. Karen, first of all, thanks for having me today. I, it is great uh, to spend some time talking about college golf, and uh, it's been an honor for me, 16 years, tenure uh, at Stanford Men's Golf and the and director of the program. Um, and so it is a, it's a passion of mine. Uh, college golf is an amazing endeavor. It's something that I, I you know, love for so many reasons. Um, my, my pathway to Stanford was kind of unique. I, I grew up in a small Midwestern town in Minnesota, um, there, it, it was very homogeneous. Uh, it was a big deal to get out of town and drive up the road a couple hours to go to the University of Minnesota um, as a student. And so for me, when I started thinking about playing collegiate golf all the way out in California, um, it was a big deal for my family and myself and a big stretch, on, honestly. And so um, I realized uh, playing a bunch of other sports, football and hockey and, and uh, doing some other things, you know, growing up in the Midwest that I was going to be out of my comfort zone, but I needed to reach a little bit. And I think that's something for, for junior golfers really around the world nowadays uh, to find the perfect spot. It takes a little bit of, of effort and some, some reach, uh, some, some courage, I guess, is the other word, too, to kind of reach out and see and explore and, and identify opportunities. Um, so for me, though, I, I got in touch with the coach at Stanford. Uh, he said to me directly the very first call, uh, Wally Goodwin is his name, and he's a Hall of Fame guy. He said, you know, I've, I've gotten a commitment from this guy named Tiger Woods next year, but this class, I, I've kind of finished recruiting. I might have an open spot, so if you can get into school uh, on your own merit, let me know, uh, and we'll see what happens. And so that's all I really needed to hear. Um, he said he had a walk-on spot for me, and um, I was always a decent student. My mom was a teacher, and my dad um, was in business, but actually, interestingly, had never gone to college, and I think both my parents, um, because of my dad's background and the wish that he had to, put, to uh, have a college degree, and my mom's background as a teacher, they pushed me and my sister hard to, to do well in school. And that's really one of the underpinnings of the college golf experience over here in the States is that you have to be academically minded and, and buy into the idea that you can do uh, high-level sport and high-level academics at the same time. It's possible. And that's maybe a different message that's spread sometimes around the globe uh, and around different cultures of teaching and coaching. But what we're into at Stanford is just that. And uh, so for me, um, I always knew I wanted to go to a good school. I had this opportunity in front of me, albeit a stretch and a reach, but I ended up getting into Stanford. And, uh, and it, was, it was one of those moments in my life that I didn't look back at. I, I just jumped at the chance, uh, made the move west to California. And then lo and behold, I was the only freshman on the team that year with Tiger coming in my sophomore year. That freshman year, I carried a lot of luggage, did a lot of different things around with the program, helped the coach in any sort of way that I could. And ultimately, we won the national championship that year, which was really a special thing and something I'll cherish forever. So um, I definitely, uh, it was a proverbial jump into the deep end um, for me. And I think that that new experience and meeting new people and new ways of life and thinking about um, all that Stanford had to offer was really a life changer for me. So that's why I'm passionate about talking about it and, and spreading that with my guys today as their coach. 
That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And um, and so we're, um, we've got a lot of good junior golfers here. I think per head of population, I think New Zealand you bats above its above its average a little bit. But I think for a lot of the kids down here, um, our our environments once they finish high school don't have those sort of three or four years of opportunities to go on and, and play a little bit of college golf. It's really, you, you go to university, which they call it over here, and obviously college over there. Um, you know, they go to university and golf kind of takes a, a backward step um, and the ability to probably move on through and play, play another four years of golf isn't really there. So uh, what have you seen with international players? Has there been any pitfalls that maybe international players have come across over the years? Um, in, in your circles? Well, I, I think that's a fair question. I think that sometimes the framework and the setup and the infrastructure underneath a student athlete is a really big deal for where they matriculate and how they matriculate. So I think um, the successful international applicants to both Stanford and here at the Division One level, Power Five level, Pac-12 conference level, um, of which Stanford sits, I find that those kids really take a proactive view of it. They say, you know, they either find a school that allows them to play enough golf uh, to still r remain competitive. They take advantage of the summer months and have a very competitive golf schedule uh, without academics involved. Um, and, and they're not afraid to travel a little bit. And I know that that's a costly experience, but I also think that there's ways around that, you know, becoming a top performer, uh, getting under the kind of the auspice of the federation, the, the, the national federation by chance um, or something like that. There's ways to offset that. And so I think a, a combination of being really proactive, knowing that you kind of have to get out of town a little bit, travel, play, compete, uh, try and get your name, you know, on a rankings list, whether that's the junior golf scoreboard or uh, here in the United States or the, the world amateur golf ranking, um, you know, something of that nature, the Australian amateur golf ranking. So uh, New Zealand ranking, you know, just trying to have some presence in the space is a key thing as a young player. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, at the end of the day, you might be bucking trends with kind of what, you know, some people are telling you to do stay locally, don't travel, you can't play golf and play school, you know, all those things. So, um, yeah. I, I think, I think it just takes a, a really dedicated person to say, Hey, I, I can see the pathway here and I'm willing to go after it. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. And have you, what, what are some of the personality traits that you've seen in, in the best college players and what are some of the pitfalls that are, that some of those players have fallen into that, that just ends up, you know, sort of ending their career a little bit or ending their time at college? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. I've been lucky to coach some really high level players and be around, you know, the likes of Tiger Woods and Nota Begay and some of the guys that were on my team, guys that I played against as a professional, you know, the, the, the best answer I can come up with is that it really boils down to how much you love the game. Um, because if you love the game enough, you're going to do all the other stuff that it takes to be successful. Um, and, and whether that's, you know, having the, 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 the tenacity to stick with it if you have some bad tournaments or um, whether that's, you know, really being honest with yourself when you do need to find areas of improvement or find new coaching or push the envelope on performance. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty lonely – golf is one of those games that it's such a social game, but it's also at the highest levels uh, a lonely game. And I think now in today's day and age with a lot of the junior golf prospects too that I look at, I'm looking for that kind of independent guy that's not afraid to kind of be off his social media or off his phone for three hours at a time and not have it bother them, you know. So those are, those are characteristics I look for when I recruit, and I think other coaches do too. And I think characteristics of some of the top young performing junior golfers around the world. So um, it's really a matter of choice to me. I always use the word volition, you know, the, it's a technical term, but it's really the power of choice. And, you know, as junior golfers come through the ranks, they're going to be given all of these choices along the way. And it's really not sometimes about how good you are. It's more about what choices you make and, uh, and how you make those choices. So um, that, that's the message I try and send a lot of times. I think there's a misperception sometimes with um, a lot of golf, junior golfers and even coaches too, myself, that you have to be a certain way. I think if there's a game that supports actually being really unique, it's golf. So really it's about um, knowing yourself, relishing in that uniqueness and making good choices. And that's where I think you're going to find the most success. 
Fantastic, fantastic. And now uh, one for the parents out there, of, we've had this discussion before, you've talked about being the CEO and the, the assistant. Um, well, what's something that the parents could, could help do for their sort of 15 or 16 year old uh, right now where they could um, you know, help them get used to college golf or help them prepare themselves for college golf? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, yeah, you, my analogy there is, is um, just to revisit that is I feel like the top level junior golfers and the one that ultimately perform the best are really the CEO of their organization. And what I mean by that is they're calling the shots. Mom and dad aren't necessarily the ones that are dictating terms as much as they are supporting. Uh, obviously, if you're paying the bills, you have a strong say. So if you're, you know, if, if you're mom and dad and you, you're like, okay, I need to tell my kid to do something. Um, that's, that's one thing, uh, based on the budgets and stuff like that. But I also think that, um, you know, they, th there is a, there is an art in parenting to give the, the, the student athlete choices too, and the ability to express themselves and be honest with the group or the people that are supporting. So I think being your own CEO and being able to call some shots and having some freedom of where you play, how you play, how much you practice, really letting that idea that. Um, it's an intrinsic motivation that, that is, is the best motivation, you know, for parents. I think those are all things that they need to understand. And I, I always tell people too, it's a red flag for me when I talk to a junior golf parent and when they tell me about good rounds, it's we, and when they tell me about bad rounds, it's he. So, um, that's something that, uh, I, I always remind parents not to, not to, to, to use. It's always about the, their student athlete by themselves performing an environment, hopefully that's, that's uh, conducive to, to high level performance. I think probably, probably sits, sits in the same boat with, with both of us. I mean, with all my juniors coming up and through and same view. I mean, there's only a few people that are out there that just want to absolutely soak in all aspects of the game. They almost become historians of the game and they, they know who's won the last 20 masters and they they know what equipment they've played and, and they just want to get up and practice every single morning. You know, yes. those, those students are the ones where, you know, you just know that the ride is just going to be exactly, well, not exactly, but how you sort of perceive it a little bit more. Um, you're certainly not having to parent them or, or push them and having to ring them up and wonder why they haven't turned up to training or haven't done their gym sessions or haven't, haven't yeah. put their staff into, you know, into um, software like Birdie Fire um anything like that you know you're not having to chase well, these guys. yeah no question i was just going to add I, I think you know you, you hit on a huge point Stu being a student of the game i mean there's a reason why tiger still goes out and practices every day and why he's trying to get better and why he changes equipment and changes coaching and thinks about his swing and you know he's a student of his own game he's a student of architecture uh he knows that it never ends and that's why we all love this game um, but I think that you, you have to give your student um, and your kid, frankly, the, the freedom to be that way. And if they're not, you know, maybe there's ways that you can kind of, you know, I've always, I've learned through coaching over the years that the more I tell my team what to do, the less results we get, but the better questions I ask, the more results we get. So, you know, I think, I think asking good questions versus telling and dictating for parents is an important thing, which leads to them being their own students for sure. That's brilliant. Yeah, 100%. And are you able to um, give people down this side of the world a little bit of an insight into a week um, of, a, of a college golfer at Sanford? Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, it, it is. It's, it's a full week. I think being a student and an athlete, a place, especially at a place like ours, which is very rigorous academically, is something that is it's, it's about um, balancing your time, uh, finding opportunities uh, to be efficient, um, I, I actually have kind of, I don't like the word efficient in golf sometimes because I think people mask efficiency for just not wanting to find it in the dirt, as Mr. Hogan used to say. So you have to be careful with the word efficiency in my mind. But um, a, a week in the life for us is if we're on campus, we're, we're um, training basically every day other than one. The NC2A gives us uh, six, six days a week, essentially, that you can use as organized team days. You get 20 hours within those weeks for organized team time. Uh, we'll work out religiously three days a week for at least an hour, hour and a half. Um, as a team dynamic, we qualify quite a lot. So we carry, most, most programs carry 10 to 12 players. Uh, you only travel with five or six for competition for the stroke play, three-day stroke play competition. So you're internally selecting your roster um, quite a lot improving proving out yourself if you're on the team quite a lot 
Um, so, and, and we, we really base our program and our training on competitive practice. That's something that we believe in strongly. Um, I feel like uh, because of our facilities and, our, and, and every player being their own CEO, that they're going to find time to work on their game, work on their swing, work on the mechanics of their golf uh, more often than not. But we like to set up an environment as coaches where our players, uh, one through 10, can show up and know that they're going to get a competitive practice experience against other great players. And I think that's, that's when all boats start to rise. So we'll spend uh, two to three, maybe four days a week with organized team practices. We'll play two to three days a week. And all of that will fit into that 20-hour work week that the NC2A allows. So it's a full... It's a full day. Um, our guys get there. They usually do class in the morning, generally golf in the afternoons, studying at night. And there's a little bit of time for social, but not as much as people would like. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. And if you don't know everyone, um, Conrad's got probably the best facility um, on the planet when it comes to a bit of practice facilities. Uh, I had the honor. He drove me around a couple of years ago and uh, we drove around your new facility with all, all the greens and, um, all the bunkers and just just a beautiful place. So if uh, if you're not motivated to go and practice, if you ever got to Stanford, well, you're never going to be. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the goal. We don't we don't want to lose a recruit because we don't we can't offer them the best practice facility or at least a practice facility that really suits all their needs. Um, I think you know going back to the practice piece too. I think practice is a big part of success. And if you're practicing to play, not practicing to practice, finding ver shot variation. Uh, keeping it fresh, doing competitive games, testing yourself all the time. Those are all things that I think can be um, really supported by a great practice facility. And we're lucky to have a great space. We have 20 acres here on campus that sits right on campus, which is rare for a lot of competitive D1 programs. So, you know, our guys can be in class, uh, be on their bikes, maybe grab a sandwich and be practicing in five or 10 minutes after class is finished. So it's a nice exercise for them. Uh, compared to some places where you do have to drive and, and find that facility. Um, all places are great. It's just a matter of those little details adding up across the board on what you're really looking for. I think that, that's a big one, certainly for the parents and, and the students looking to maybe come over and, and uh, get into the college scene is that they really should look into those different facilities and the logistics of having to go from campus to golf course to practice facilities. I think that, that certainly takes a toll and maybe something that maybe a lot of people don't realize or understand. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I, I think between the operational logistics of a, of a given day for a college student athlete, I think that's a really important thing to factor in. I think the level of support services that universities offer too, because as we all know nowadays, it's just not about hitting golf shots. It's about strength and conditioning. So the staff that's offered there, the facilities around that, uh, nutrition, sports psychology, um, club fitting, club repair, uh, you know, all of those things are factors in our guys developing into better golfers and, and better student athletes too. Academic support obviously kind of goes without saying, but I think as, as um, parents and student athletes that are new to the system in the U.S., explore, you'll find really varying levels of that, and it, it's worth the time to do the homework on on what's offered by each program. And you also touched there before about um, you've, you've got a big, uh, a big squad there, say 10 to 12, and then maybe you've only got four or five playing. What do the other people do um, during that time when you're off playing? Are they, how do they keep the game up or how do you actually select those squads? Do you, yeah, you do we, we do um, qualifying quite a lot, as I mentioned. Um, when we're on the road, uh, a couple things happen for the guys at home. One, they're focusing and we help them with that through, through statistical collection and practice plans, but they're analyzing and thinking about areas that they need to do, uh, that they need to work on to get better and hopefully get in the lineup at some point. Um, they, they also put on their, their student caps a little stronger. So they're, they're going to class and really getting ahead with their work. So when the team does come back, they're fresh and ready to go and ready to jump at it again. Um, and they're working out physically. A lot of times, you know, the, that means if a freshman, let's say, doesn't make a, a, a trip, he'll get two extra workouts in that week on campus while we're away. Um, so there's a lot of activity that still goes on while the team is, is on the road traveling. But I, I do think you bring up a fair point for student athletes looking at schools and trying to find out where they fit in. I think just really running the forecast on how much they will play, how quickly they will play, digging into the qualifying scheme of the coach at hand, 
asking them how he picks the team, uh, what are the nuances around that, asking the actual team if you can, interviewing them some and asking how easy it is to break into the lineup. Those are all good, good points to raise for young student athletes investigating the best school for, their, for themselves. Because I, I could just imagine a few people being down here and going, oh, you know, hey, we got on the golf squad. And then they don't go and play for the first two years and not understanding yeah. why, not understanding those. But, oh, actually, you, you might not get on the team until your last two years of college. Um, yeah. that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, you, you've got two years of development and getting better and um, finding a place within that team. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's why, you know, it's great to have options. and explore a number of diff different institutions because depending on the level that they play at or the budgets that they might have, you might find more opportunity at different places. So, you know, working through that and getting a feel for that's important. Yep. And have you, have you had anybody really you know, like come to the squad and feel like they've really grinded it out, done everything that they need to do and, and just haven't got onto the playing squad as soon as, as soon as they yeah. expected? How have you managed yep. that? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a reality. Um, mm. I think to me that the, you hit the nail on the head and that you have to be, you know, it, it, what, what I guess better said, you can't let like getting in the roster be your real mandate. It's, it, you know, we, we try and uh, foster a culture of just game development and see how good you can get. And, and if you're really thinking about how good you can get, you're not worried about individual rounds individual tournaments you're looking at the grander picture of okay where's my game stack up and if I have a goal of being an all-american someday it might not matter if I qualify for this tournament at hand I might need to make changes I might need to tackle things that are a little daunting in terms of my game or parts of my game I don't want to work on um, and and so and so working through that is is really an important you know process the mindset is key um, but yeah I, I think I think that's a reality there are times where guys will come in and they'll maybe go down the wrong road a little bit with their swing or they'll lose some confidence. And then all of a sudden it's really a hard fight. So, you know, I think being open and honest about that is, is an important deal. Yeah. That is brilliant. And um, do they, like, I, I know that you're not always the only coach. Is, is that correct with some of your players on the team? Like they might have yeah. their own individual coaches from wherever they've come from or outside of that. I think like a lot of people down here, Probably if yeah. they expected they got on the team at Stanford, they're like, oh, well, Conrad's the man. He's got all the answers. Is, is that true? Or Yeah, I would say that for some I am. Um, for some, we, you know, nowadays, though, the really high-level junior golfers from around the world, most of them have swing coaches um, in place already. You know, just, just like, you know, I think it's interesting because I think sometimes – uh, I, I call them, I, I like to refer to them as swing mechanics. I think there's different levels of coach, you know, coach is a really broad term. I know a lot of guys that have guys that help them mechanically with their swing, but don't really watch them play or don't really watch them on the scoring elements or work with them on, on those avenues. Whereas I think that's our forte as college coaches is we're probably less swing oriented and more score oriented and, um, and develop or development oriented. And so, that's where, you know, we play a kind of a dual role. If a kid needs swing, swing mechanical help, we we're versed in that. Um, but if he doesn't, and he has his own swing coach back home nowadays with technology and all the opportunities that exist there, um, I think there's, there's ways that we can, we can work around that, you know? So it really depends on the individual. Um, I often say to people too, that we as college coaches, especially at Stanford need to be kind of the, the guy that keeps the, keeps the student athlete in between the lines. And so we know enough to get in trouble. So if a, a young guy takes a lesson or is doing something a little unique with his equipment setup or is trying something weird, we have a relationship where we'll say, Hey, I would think twice about that, Johnny, you know, before you go down that road and it saves them time and effort to try and get back to where they were. So we're, we're almost uh, quality control managers as much as we are, uh, you know, swing instructors too. Yeah. And I suppose that's one of the big pitfalls, especially with the internet and, and the kids being able to access so much information these days that they can fall in some of those pitfalls of going and changing the driver when it's unnecessary or, or actually not changing the driver when it is necessary. Um, you know, yeah. being up to date with all the latest equipment, um, making sure that they are making the right changes for, I would say that, that long-term development, looking at the big picture to say, well, we're here for, for four years and, like what you said before, it's not about maybe next week's tournament. It might be about next year's tournament. And yeah. um, 
I mean, that, that's probably a big one for me personally, even even um, looking after younger kids is you know, saying to mum and dad, this is about the long term. It's certainly not about the short term, but just trying to help them understand that um, you know, hey, we're here for the long haul, not the short haul. And I suppose you've yeah. had a few conversations with parents over the years of, hey, they didn't play very well this week. What's going on? You know. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't, I don't ever want to say st- standoffish, um, but I, I work quickly and and diligently with my parents um, right away when they get there to make it clear that I, I don't really talk golf with them. I talk well-being of their kid, um, you know, academics, something that's important. But if it's about the X's and O's and like the scores, I don't spend a whole lot of time even, you know, entertaining those conversations with parents. Part of too the college experiences you know, young, young men and women going off and kind of becoming their own people too. And that's, that's part of, um, you know, providing them a really good environment to do that. And, and honestly, I've never, I've never really met a great golfer that hasn't failed more than they've succeeded. So, um, you you know, unless you want to focus on the negatives all the time, you just got to kind of keep moving forward and, and understand that it's a really hard game at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's brilliant. And are you able to talk a little bit about, say, uh, an international student, someone here from New Zealand, they want to come and do college golf, but their actual goal is to become, uh, you know, go and play on the professional level. Maybe it's the Corn Ferry Tour, maybe it's the PGA Tour. Um, what, what sort of numbers and what sort of players and stats have you seen over the years of, of those people being able to make it to the tour? I know you um, spent a bit of yeah. time with Maverick McNeely and obviously with yeah. Tiger and uh, Noda Begay, I think. Uh, Casey Martin as well was it? Yeah. In the day. So those yeah. guys have all made it. But you know, what what are, what are the sort of numbers um, and the the chances of these kids making it out onto the professional scene? Well, I I, I mean, I guess the way I would put it is, um, I think we do a lot of really strong game development, and I think if you looked around at some of the top Division One programs in the country, based on the relative number of players that pass through the program and then ultimately the number of players that matriculate to the tour, then, you know, it's, it's another way to say that it's really difficult to get your professional status. And it's one thing to have a cup of tea, as they say, you know, like, okay, I've made it through a Q school, but can you really um, call it a career? Are you in a position to have a sustainable career uh, year over year, making enough, enough, enough money to pay your bills and then some, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's the, that's the real kind of what if to me, because I think there's varying levels of success as a pro. Um, we've had, we've had a handful of guys, frankly, go out on tour and stay there. Um, so that's how difficult it is. And so, you know, my line always is, is, has been, well, why wouldn't you want to go get a college degree somewhere and, and get, you know, entertain the idea of having the chance to hopefully someday pursue it. Um, you know, I, I also think that the way that pro golf has gone, it's gotten more complex, more technical. Uh, you have to make very important decisions with limited information. Um, you want a college degree in your back pocket, uh, when you're a pro, um, and having been through it, as you mentioned with Maverick and Patrick Rogers and seeing Tiger operate, if they're not CEOs of their own companies, I don't know what that is. And, and I don't, I don't think there's any better backup plan, any better, um, support place, any better place to kind of learn those skills that you need to run your own shop and doing college golf and trying to be competitive at the same time. So um, there, there definitely is a certain element of, are you good enough? Um, the debate ensues on how you really go about it. And I think if you're 16, 17 years old and you think you're good enough to play pro golf, that's great. But uh, you might be inside the ropes, but you probably aren't outside the ropes in terms of your personal maturity and your development to manage what uh, the lifestyle of PGA golf is. So, you know, that's just my two cents. Yeah. no, no. So, all right, and, and that's a good little point just to say, Hey, look, it, it's not just golf. You're not coming over to college to play golf. The, the education side of it, it goes hand in hand. And I suppose you've really got to put the education first and just be grateful that you're out there, be able to play, play golf six days a week on the yeah. side and, um, and, and see how sort of, eventuates and matures over the next sort of three or four years. Well, yeah. The other, the final point I'd add is that think about in your golf career too, how very few times in your golf life, you actually get to play for someone or something bigger than yourself. And, and that's mm. what college golf offers too. When you can carry the Stanford bag or represent a, a you know, a reputable institution, whatever it is. Um, it's a powerful thing. You, you, you create friendships and relationships with your teammates that you'll have for the rest of your life too. So those are all positives that I think 
get lost in that conversation sometimes too when when people are saying debating whether or not just to turn pro straight away or go play collegiate golf right yeah uh, brilliant. And like, one, one of the things probably for the parents and the families down here is we get a lot of uh, the recruiting agencies trying to do a dual dab and take a bit of money off people to uh, get them some scholarships or get them onto the team. What are, what are your thoughts in around that? Yeah, for the I, I, you know, frankly, um, you know, I understand that some places, you know, they're under-resourced, right? They, they maybe aren't exposed as much to kind of the national or international junior golf scene as they might want or need. Um, and so I think depending on, on the service that you're talking to, they might have that resource or they might have that exposure that you don't otherwise have. But frankly, I think most of that can be found in um, being courageous, being investigative and having an internet signal. You know, I think that there's not a college uh, golf program over here. I can promise you that you can't garner access in some way, either an email address, a cell phone number, um, a coach's name, um, a golf camp you know, situation, you know, there's, there's just ways to access the, the market over here um, than, you know, than paying a bunch of money to try and have someone represent you. So, um, you know, I'm, I've not been a huge fan of recruiting services, frankly. Um, but I, I, I also want to be careful not to kind of throw them under the bus because sometimes I think they serve a purpose for, for some. So, you know, it's yeah. uh, it, it is, it is a balancing act and, I just feel like if a person's really um, ambitious and um, they want to, they want to find out information, they can find it on their own if they do some work. Yeah. And what do, or where, where could some of the parents and the families, what would be the best place for them to go to, to try and find out some information about NCAA and those rules and regulations? Cause we hear, obviously hear a lot of it. You know, yeah. You're obviously divided by like those 20 hours or, or what's some documents or web pages they could go to. Yeah. To, well, I think, I think a great resource is a website that I'm on almost every day. It's called Junior Golf Scoreboard. Um, that's, a, that's a run by a, 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 a domestic gentleman over here named Mac Thayer. It's essentially a database with a bunch, of, um, a bunch of information ancillary to the database and the ranking he puts out. One of the things I always encourage people to do and young junior golfers internationally is that you, could, you can very much, um, with a subscription to Junior Golf Scoreboard, and I'm not trying to endorse them. I just think it's a nice site. Um, but you can figure out what other kids are doing. And that's, that's something that I would, you know, a, a pretty easy research, you know, project is look up the top hundred players on junior golf scoreboard. Uh, it might even show where they've committed to go to school. Um, from there, it would lead you to uh, the school itself and maybe a web page that is attached to that profile. Um, you can also compare yourself to what some of those scores are, the, the, the kids are shooting and the yardages they're playing. The tournament schedule is always a big question. And maybe you're not going to do every tournament that you see, but it's at least it gives you a sample of, of what to check out and where to go. Um, so I, I really like the Junior Golf Scoreboard. Um, over here domestically, our, our, our biggest junior tour is the AJGA Tour, which is the American Junior Golf Association Tour. You know, the AJGA offers a lot of playing opportunities, but it is a little complex in terms of qualifying. So it's more, again, that's an investigative, uh, maybe as simple as a phone call to their office to kind of ask about, you know, opportunities that might exist. So um, there, 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 are, there is a little legwork there, but I think those are a couple sites I would, I would maybe consider visiting. Brilliant, brilliant. I will definitely pass that on. Oh, no, that's been a great chat, Conrad, and um, really appreciate your time. And I was yeah. actually, I was, I was wondering if you might be able to tell everybody down here in New Zealand about your, uh, your little bus trip with uh, Tiger when, uh, <laughs> when you had to do the luggage. It was a, it was a great oh, yeah. my, my, I, I have a few Tiger stories. That's probably the cleanest one I can share. No, I, I shouldn't <laughs> joke like that. But uh, um, so Tiger being, uh, being teammates and a year older, um, there is a famous story that when Tiger showed up as a freshman, uh, he, you know, understandably after winning the U S amateur a couple weeks before coach actually stuck him in there for the first event as a freshman, he didn't have to qualify. So we all load up in the van and, and I actually was like the sixth or seventh guy on the roster at that stage as a sophomore, uh, still really hadn't worked into the starting lineup, but I was driving the van up to San Francisco airport. So we pull along the curb and Nota Begay, a multi-time all American jumps out and he and Casey Martin and a few of the older guys start to head into the terminal and Tiger joins him, joins right up shoulder to shoulder. And they're like, hey, freshman, you need to go get the luggage. That's our team. That's our team uh, rule or, or kind of our, 
a regulation. And, and Tiger didn't like that a whole lot. He's like, well, I'm not going to carry your luggage. He said, I, why would I carry your luggage when I think I can beat you? And uh, notice that Noda perked up and said, well, if, if that's the case, um, if you beat me there, we were going to Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, by the way, the UNM course, which was a notice, one of Noda's home courses that he grew up on. So he was pretty confident at this point. And he said, uh, he said, well, Tiger, if you beat me this first event, um, you don't have to touch another piece of luggage the rest of your time here. So reluctantly, Tiger went back and unloaded the van and got a couple carts and got the luggage inside. But sure enough, fast forward a, a few days later, he, he comes out of the, I went back up with the van to pick him up and he starts laughing. He said, well, um, looks like I won't be uh, carrying any more luggage. He, turned, he ends up winning the tournament first out of the gate. And that was really cool. Everyone was excited for him. They thought that was pretty clutch. And, you know, yeah. the Tiger legend starts to grow or continues to grow yeah. at that stage. The only downside uh, of that story was that I was the next guy on the list. So yours truly ended up having to carry the luggage, um, you know, on any <laughs> of the other trips for the rest of the year. So um, uh, be, careful, be careful what you ask for sometimes. And, yeah. you know, I can, I can tell you that's one of the things that has drawn everyone to Tiger over the years is that, when he says he's going to do something or has a chance to win, he usually capitalizes. And uh, it's been yeah. neat to see how he's changed the game and how he's impacted Stanford golf and our culture. And, and uh, who knows what's left for the guy. He's still going at yeah. it. So it's, uh, it's yeah. exciting to follow. Oh, it'll be, it'll be good. I, yeah. It'll be really good to see if he can get a couple more majors under the belt and uh, yeah. just take it out. Let the legend grow on for a little bit, a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know he was really uh, happy about how that President's Cup shook out. So, um, and uh, his good play around a wonderful golf course. I, I wish we had more courses in the United States like Royal Melbourne. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful place. Oh, that, that sound belt. They really just have some great courses in along there. So, just a great sport in the world. I need to get down there and, and play some great courses where you're at too, here in New Zealand and, and, uh, yeah. and Australia and make that trip uh, one that I think will – will be a lifelong memory for sure. Oh, that's right. Well, maybe we'll get you down here and we'll, uh, we'll do a little camp down here one year. That'd be great. Sign me up. Hey. Awesome, mate. Thanks for your time, Conrad. Okay. Really appreciate it. And um, look, anybody, if you, if you want to get in, in touch with Conrad, uh, with Conrad, he's on Twitter a fair bit um, and he's man to get a hold of. But uh, contact a few of those, uh, those websites, the um, Junior Golf Scoreboard, like what Conrad said, and... Um, Think about the future. Right? It's always about the future and long-term development. Yeah, no Go doubt on. about it. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Appreciate all you're doing. Thanks, Conrad. Okay. Talk to yeah. you. Have, have a great one. Bye. Well, we made it to the end. Well done, everybody. What a great chat with the NCAA Division I head coach of the Stanford University golf team, Conrad Ray. Some wonderful insights into the college golf world over there in America. Um, you really got to take a good look into that interview and just take some really good little nuggets out of there of what it takes to be an elite golfer at an NCAA Division I college. He's a great man with great insights into the game and understanding what it takes not only to be a great golfer, but also to be a great human being and help be a part of a team and be, something, um, be part of something that's a little bit bigger than just yourself. It's not just about golf, it's about your academics as well. So take those insights and if you need a hand or if you need any more information about college golf in America or your development into that pathway, if you're thinking about making it over to America anytime in the near future, please give us a call or, or give us an email. We'd love to chat to you, help you out in your progress and, and your pathway over to America. Uh, enjoy your day, everybody. Our details are on the next slide. And uh, have a wonderful evening. Bye for now.